and his son inexplicably, the, the way she was funny, to jump in the car and lock the doors and windows and release the passenger brake. And even was laughing and waving at his dad. <laughs> and, you know, ha, 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 look what I did, dad. Um, the car then drifted uh, down uh, into Lake Washington. And Dr. Furukawa, he actually dove into the water and attempted to lift that car up and push it back. You know, that's how distressed he was. And while it was happening, he said this. He left his physical body and he joined his son. And the two of them rose up together into a place that, you know, they perceived as being heaven. And he was with his son. And he, this was the most joyful experience he could imagine. I'm here today with Dr. Melvin Morris. Dr. Melvin Morris has joined us before. He has done some research into near-death experiences, um, studied extensively, extensively children's experiences and has recorded their artwork. And he is here to share today some really interesting stories never before heard. So thank you so much, Dr. Morris, for joining me today. I'm really excited to have this discussion with you. Okay. I'm... Should we just jump right in? Let's just jump right in, yes. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today is the whole range of spiritual experiences that surround the dying process, premonitions of death, shared dying experiences, people at the bedside who witness various spiritual events, you know, as their loved ones die, after death communications. And then really there, there's the richness of what goes on. And Tia, this isn't just about, you know, touchy feely, oh, you know, it's okay if they want to believe in spirituality, blah, blah, blah. Um, first of all, for those of you who have had spiritual experiences, as you're going to see today, science has your back. Our brain is a spiritual brain. We are specifically hardwired to have spiritual experiences. Obviously, evolution and, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of years uh, of evolving the human uh, species, we would not have evolved perhaps one third of our brain to be able to have a spiritual experience unless they're real. I mean, what a waste of, you know, that's not how evolution works. Um, so, you know, I think that that's important as we understand. But greater than that, I just, you know, for those of you who are listening, who've had a loved one die, you know, and, and today, in today's world, we die in intensive care units. We truly die alone, you know, because we're hooked up to machines and, and such as that. We spend in the United States billions of dollars a year on medical care that does not prolong life one minute. Well, maybe a minute, okay, but certainly not more than a day. Um, you know, and I'm not talking about you know, like particularly with children. I mean, with children, uh, I, uh, I'll reintroduce myself to your uh, listeners. I'm a former pediatric uh, intensive care unit doc. So it's sure we're going to pour, you know, as much money as necessary if there's a chance that a child could live. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about medical care in adults that everybody knows does not prolong life for more than a day or two. And the quality of that life, you know, is basic. So why do we do it? Well, study after study <laughs> documents that doctors do it because they think patients want it. And patients do it because they thought that the doctor made them, that it was expected of them. They thought it was wrong, uh, you know, that their loved ones are tortured and you know, the last uh, days of their life, but they just thought, well, that's the medical system. So no one is talking about death and dying. And yet, 
it's as we're going to turn into this next hour, it's an incredibly rich spiritual time that, you know, if we could simply start to talk about the spirituality of death and dying, which after all is very inspiring, um, can plant the seeds to heal grief, uh, you know, uh, can establish meaning in meaningless situations, then maybe we could start to have that necessary larger dialogue about what kind of medical care for death and dying. Because after all, if, you know, if your loved one is dying in an intensive care unit, you're not going to really get a chance to appreciate uh, all of the spiritual events that go on. And so, you know, so the stakes to me are high. Um, you know, this is to me a very important topic. And, uh, and nobody should ever feel, uh, you know, if you have an intuition and a feeling that you had a experience, you probably did. So how, let, me, let me just tell you how I started in all this. As we talked about in the first podcast, uh, my uh, research group at Seattle Children's Hospital, we studied near-death experiences in children. And we did what's a gold standard prospective study, meaning that we we didn't take volunteers and we didn't, you know, research people. And, but as they had cardiac arrests over a 15-year period, we then interviewed them and asked them what it was like, what experiences they had. Um, and we showed that near-death experiences are real, that they occur at the end of life. Everybody will have one. Um, you know, you can be a Nazi prison guard and you're going to have one. Uh, you can, you know, the, the unconditional love. Well, that's why we humans can't do it. <laughs> unconditional, you know, tough thing to swallow. Unconditional love when you die. And these are not caused by oxygen, lack of oxygen, medications, or any of that sort of thing. And in case people think that this isn't science, we published in the American Medical Association's pediatric journals. And we were the heads of the Department of Neurology and Intensive Care Unit in Psychiatry at Stanford's Hospital. So this is science. The AMA is not publishing about near-death experiences unless our science is solid. And uh, other people have uh, published similar studies in The Lancet, arguably the world's most uh, a prestigious medical journal. So I'm going to tell you the story. I, I think I shared it with you before, but uh, it's the story of Chris Eggleston. And he was a young man. Oh, he was probably eight or nine. And his parents were ski instructors in the Pacific Northwest. So they uh, were teaching all day. And uh, they drove home that evening at 11 o'clock at night. And coming down from the Cascade Mountains, and the snow was so thick that the cars behind them in the road, they could only see the, the taillights of the cars in front of them. And they slid on a steep curve and hit a guardrail and flipped over the guardrail and plunged into the river below. Um, it's amazing how they were rescued. So I, I do want to share this for a moment. Um, a man was following them and he suddenly saw their taillights disappear. And instead of just going hum over, you know, whatever, he actually stopped. He wanted to know why those taillights suddenly disappeared. And so he was the one uh, that then uh, called 911. And, uh, you know, of course, our team uh, went out to resuscitate. Uh, <clears throat> both a child uh, and uh, parents. Uh, they were, uh, oh, I think about 10 feet of water, underwater. Um, one son had died and uh, the father uh, died also uh, in the clinical. The mother managed to free herself by kicking out the uh, windshield and she uh, flew, uh, you know, uh, rose to the surface. And then Chris, um, he was finally resuscitated after being underwater about 45 minutes. And as any ICU docs and listening to this know, you're not dead till you're warm and dead. So uh, we were able to resuscitate him. 
and his experience was amazing. It's such an honor to have heard these experiences for the first time because they change afterwards. And I said to him, so, you know, tell me about, you know, what it was like to be in the intensive care unit and what do you remember? And he said, I was in a huge noodle. It was a noodle going to heaven. And then he looks, he's like, he gets this look of puzzlement on his face. He goes, no, no, no. It couldn't have been a noodle because noodles don't have rainbows in them. And so, you know, by hearing this story the first time, you know, he's not making this up, you know, but sure. I mean, after, after he's told it and, you know, everything, you know, sure. Then he, he says that he's in a tunnel, but to be able to hear it that first time has that evil thing. And then he looks at me, Tia, and he goes, what's real? You know, his going to heaven and, you know, the experiences. And he said, because if it's real, you've got to tell people. <laughs> so, uh, you know, much of our study, we proved that they are, in fact, real. Um, <clears throat> but then the mother said to me, if his experience was real, then I want to know if my experience was real. And her experience was that after she uh, was pulled, uh, you know, to the, uh, you know, covered with blankets, sitting on a rock, looking at them or resuscitating her uh, children below, that her husband was sitting there right next to her, looking as real as this experience is. And he says, everything will be all right. She's furious. How can you say everything's all right? And why are you just sitting there? Why aren't you down there? And she's screaming at him. And then he vanished. And uh, sure enough, you know, he did, actually did not make it out of the car. So, uh, you know, he had, she had an after death visit from him. And her intuition, I believe, is correct. That if the near death experience is real, then all of the spiritual events surrounding death and dying are real. We can't really do a sophisticated study of after death communications or, you know, they're just not predictable enough. Um, but uh, we definitely showed that near death experiences are real. So all the time, Tia, I'm always hearing people say, but aren't, aren't near death experiences just neurotransmitters at the point of death? Yes, that's correct. Near-death experiences are caused by a specific area of our brain, and we even know the neurological pathways that cause the experience uh, to, to happen. Just like we know the neurochemistry and the you know, physical parts of your brain, which allow you to see, which allow you to hear. The, the problem with the statement is just neurochemicals is the word just. No, it's neurochemicals. That's what makes it real. You know, as you know, what is this reality? Uh, you know, it turns out that modern neuroscience matches the Tibetan uh, masters of, you know, the fifth, uh, the fifth century uh, AD, um, that this reality we create by sampling the electromagnetic field, which is the actual reality, or what kids call realer than real. We sample that. We turn those signals uh, into neurochemical processes, and then we create this reality inside our head. Everything that we experience is neurochemicals. And that's the main thing that I believe that all those spiritual events surrounding death and dying are real because they're all from the same clinical pathways. Well, so what kinds of experiences do people have and, and why, why are they important? Okay, I, I'm gonna talk first a little bit about premonitions of death. I did a large study with the uh, Southwest SIDS, uh, you know, Sudden Infant Death uh, Institute. And we showed that it's very common for mothers usually to have profound premonitions that their child is going to die. And yet, we, we studied this for about a year, and I had carefully had control patients. I had, I had a group of mothers who had children, 
and they just wrote down, you know, their whatever their feelings were, what their dreams were. You know, did they also have dreams their the babies uh, were uh, going to pass? You know, so we had to, you know, have that control group. And sure enough, that doesn't happen. Um, only the people who, you know, tragically had sudden infant death had these premonitions. And yet, we didn't find any premonitions which led to safe. I mean, that's a really, and th this was, uh, I, I actually had one patient uh, who was actually in the study. And she came to me in my private office and she said, Dr. Morse, I know something horrible is going to happen tonight. You know, you've got to admit my baby to the hospital. You've got to do something. You know, and she told me about this very vivid dream that she'd had. And yet, the child was fine. I mean, you know, there was nothing that I could see that was wrong. And, you know, I did say to her, you know, why don't you go up to Seattle Children's Hospital? You know, they, they can maybe look deeper. So she took her baby to Ch Seattle Children's Hospital and told him the same thing. I know something horrible is going to happen tonight. And they did a variety of tests. They did CAT scans and, you know, everything they could think of. The baby seemed as healthy as can be. They discharged the baby and several later, later, the baby died of sudden infant death. So, so this premonition is not to prevent something. Instead, it does something more important and more powerful. Because I would later, later saw her in follow-up and I said to her, you know, I just feel sick about this. You know, you came to me with your baby and, and I couldn't help you. And, you know, you went to children's and they couldn't help you. You must be angry. And she said, absolutely not. You see, to, for, for parents to lose a child destroys your sense of what is reality, what is meaning. It's so meaningless. It makes people no longer want to believe in God. It makes people, it makes their lives seem like a joke. You know, this is not supposed to happen. And she said to me, I realized that this premonition was a message. That there is a reason for what happened. That that's what that premonition meant. Is that was to tell me that everything is okay. That this is, I mean, believe me, it does not blunt the grief. It doesn't blunt the pain. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not in any way implying that. But it does restore meaning to an otherwise meaningless, horrible truth. And I have found this uh, again and again um, when I've uh, uh, studied premonitions. Um, these, I know these are, these are difficult stories to hear. I, I, you know, I'll try to be as, as, you know, bland about them as I can, but I don't think that you can understand the power of these spiritual experiences unless you understand where they're coming from. I had a patient who um, was late for work, all of us are, tragically jumped in the car, threw it in reverse, back down his driveway, and unfortunately, um, you know, collided with his daughter, and uh, she, you know she passed as a result of that. So, what? I mean, how as a parent can you live with that? I mean, that is like, you know, he went through her things, and he found a picture that she had drawn two days earlier. And the picture was a picture of exactly what happened to her. And then she wrote under it, forgive daddy. So if we're constantly trivializing and ignoring and, and thinking, oh, spiritual experiences are just neurochemicals, uh, like as if this conversation isn't just neurochemicals, um, we're going to miss the power of these experiences to at least plant the seed for healing because it did heal that man. 
he eventually was able to forgive himself. And it all started with his daughter's premonition of, of, of what happened to her. I'll, I'll tell you one that I think is, is, is less, is it more funny than, <laughs> um, well, I had another patient and um, she had a very vivid dream that her son looked like a ninja turtle. And he said to her, look, mommy, I'm a ninja turtle now. But, you know, the, the mark of these dreams is typically the parent will say, I never had a dream like it before. It was vividly real. I felt I was awake. You know, so these are not just, you know, the usual kind of dreams that we have, you know, or anxiety produced or whatever. So uh, she was driving with him and uh, he was uh, uh, in the passenger seat uh, next to her. Uh, and uh, she uh, made a left turn uh, into oncoming traffic. And um, you know, she miscalculated and the car, her car was hit right on the passenger side. He, he did not die. Um, he eventually full, had a full recovery. But nevertheless, she's crushed with guilt. I mean, what, you know, that, you know, I, I've got, you know, well, my daughter's graduating from, and just, you know, these stories, you know, any parent hears them. So he's hospitalized and he had so many nodes that they had to put all these casts on him. And one day she's sitting there at his bedside and the nurse breezily comes in and says, oh, look at him. He's a Ninja Turtle. He looks just like a Ninja Turtle. He's become a Ninja Turtle, you know, and started laughing with the young man. And he was like saying, yes, look, mommy, I'm a Ninja Turtle, just like he is dream and this you know again i'm not saying it's easy but at least it planted the seeds that she could ultimately forgive herself for what she had done and he made a full recovery uh, etc so you know that's what i see in terms of um a premonition of death is now so what's a shared dying experience um, I'm going to tell you the experience of an allergist at my hospital. Uh, Dr. Furukawa uh, was uh, head of the Department of Allergies uh, at uh, Seattle Children's. And here's what he told me. This guy's a you know physician. He made the same assumption as Chris Eggleston's mom. He said, I've read your research. I presented it at Grand Rounds that day. He said, it's amazing. It's solid. It's scientific. It, and so, therefore, my experience must also be true. And here's what happened to him. Um, he uh, liked to uh, get uh, uh, crawfish uh, out of Lake Washington. And he would go there every morning with his son. And his son, inexplicably, the, the way he was funny to jump in the car and lock the doors and windows and released the passenger brake and even was laughing and waving at his dad <laughs> and you know ha 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 look what i did dad um the car then drifted uh down uh, into lake washington and dr furkawa he actually dove into the water and attempted to lift that car up and push it back you know th that's how distressed he was and while it was happening, he said this, he left his physical body and he joined his son. And the two of them rose up together into a place that, you know, they perceived as being heaven. And he was with his son. And he, this was the most joyful experience he could imagine. This was just the pure love of the universe that bathes us when we die. He was bathed with. And a voice said to him, do you want to stay here? Or do you want to go back? And Dr. Furkawa told me that that's the most difficult, the most difficult question he'd ever been asked. 
and yet he just felt he had to go back. The, you know, he was an allergist, uh, as he told me once, that his, he and his wife realized, even though they had suffered this tragic loss, he said, but they're all our children. Um, you know, the, and so he decided to go back. Um, and he eventually returned to consciousness. Uh, it was not successful at getting the car out of the water, uh, but he uh, then made it to uh, the bank um, and uh, you know, survived. And again, he at least experienced the love that his son was bathed in, that all of us will be bathed in when we die. It's a love that we don't experience in this world. We can't love unconditionally. Really, think about it, friend. I know, I know on Facebook, everybody's, oh yeah, I love unconditionally. I have unconditional love for you. Uh, well, maybe not for serial killers, but <laughs> but yeah, I love everybody else. Well, well, maybe let's say, let's you know, let's, you know, let's say have a certain political belief that I don't believe in. But, but no, 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 but I love everybody. <laughs> no, this was true unconditional love. And people that have experienced it have never experienced it before. And sometimes the reason for that is not just to receive the love, but learn to love like that and learn to receive the love that others have for us. And that's a lot of what Dr. Furukawa um, experienced. That's what he learned from his experience. So that's a shared dining experience. So. What about after death? Well, you know, I have to be looking for it. That message wants to get to you somehow, but it can be difficult because obviously after death, we're so consumed with sadness. And, you know, I mean, we can't, we can't be open to a spiritual experience uh, the neurotransmitters uh, won't work when our brain is flooded with, you know, the dopamine and, you know, all the various neurochemicals associated with anxiety and grief. But I, I'm going to share with you how that message will get to you if, if you're alert and awake and aware. So I was uh, asked to speak at the uh, hospital in uh, Vancouver. Uh, Canada, and to give a talk to a hospice community there, and to speak to the grieving parents. And I was I had just finished my sudden infant death study, so we had all the statistics of you know how do you know if it's a true premonition or not? And basically, that what I shared with you before that they're vivid, they're not like any dream you've had before. They're what we call lucid dreams. So. Uh, somebody came to pick me up at the airport, as they commonly do, and um, she heard my spiel. I was saying, this is what I'm going to talk about tonight. She looked at me and she said, you know, actually, last night, I had exactly that kind of dream. I had a lucid, vivid dream that was very real, and it has nothing to do with anything you're talking about. I dreamed that this little boy was playing with a dog and throwing him a ball. I mean, so obviously that's not any kind of spiritual experience or premonition or anything like that. Maybe, you know, maybe you got it all wrong. Maybe uh, people just have these kinds of dreams, signing meaning to them, you know, if they have to do a spiritual. Okay, so I go to Vancouver Children's and I'm giving my talk to the grieving parents. And I happened to mention this. I said, you know something? Well, maybe it's not always true. You know, maybe you could have a lucid, vivid dream and it wouldn't be spiritual. And so I told him the story. I said, uh, the person that drove me here to from the airport uh, told me about this dog. This was, it was like a golden retriever. He's a little boy. He seemed to be five or six years old. And he kept playing and throwing a ball. One of the mothers started screaming, that's my son. That's his dog. 
So this was for her. And I said to her, I said, you know, tell me more. And she said, I have been craving message from him. And I feel so angry, even at you, Dr. Morris, because you're telling all these beautiful stories where these children say they wanted to go back. And, you know, well, my son, he obviously didn't want to go back. You know, he just, you know, traveled on. And I'm not having death communications. And yet the people with her said, but you are crying all day long. You know, and, you know, I mean, understandably enough. And she came to understand that this was how her son <laughs> took this sort of <laughs> contortion, <laughs> contorted way to get this message to her, that he was all right. And it brought her such relief that eventually she started to have a relationship uh, with him. Um, you know, so that's what the power of an after-death communication can be if we're willing to believe it. And we can believe it because science got your back because about one third of your brain is dedicated to having such experiences. And it's not just a neurochemical. It is the hard core. This means your brain is working right. It's working as it's supposed to, uh, to give you an after-death communication, a premonition, whatever help you might need from the universe. I want to just finish up with after-death communications because they're very simple. They really are. Invariably, they involve a message. I'm all right. Don't cry, mommy. And typical way is that, you know, is at the foot of the bed, presents there in the middle of the night, etc. But this issue of grief is so powerful. It's not just as simple as, okay, I'll just, you know, lean back and, you know, wait for my after-death communication. It doesn't really work that way. So you have to be alert. What do I mean by that? Uh, for example, um, I had a patient once uh, who uh, was a, um, a teenager and uh, she had leukemia and unfortunately passed. Her parents and her had wanted to go see the Lion King. This was just, just, just as her, like, you know, this was my wish. This is how I want to spend my days. I want to go see the Lion King with my uh, parents. And it was all arranged for uh, them to go to, because uh, she'd been hospitalized, you know, to get her stable enough to go and everything. And uh, it was all planned. And then, unfortunately, she couldn't go. So the parents, they didn't know what to do. They were like, well, I mean, I mean, should we go anyway? I mean, you know, I mean, that would seem, you know, to honor, honor our daughter. Well, no, it's too, you know, I mean, it's painful. And, and I mean, and what, what honor is her? I mean, you know, obviously it was just, you know, something that we tried and it just didn't work out. And, you know, that she had, you know, the depression and, all of that. But at the last minute, they said, no, we're going to go. But they looked at each other and they said, we're never going to find parking. We're never going to be able to, you know, so it's futile to go anyway. Why should we go? We have just enough time to get. Well, all righty. So they jumped in the car. They drove down there in a parking place right in front of uh, the you know the facility that had the uh, play um, right in front of it opened up right while they were driving down the street I mean, an unheard of uh, event <laughs> and uh, they parked there they knew that their daughter had arranged that for them they knew it they knew it in their heart and their soul so sometimes you also have to you know, be able to trust your intuition. You have to be able to have that sense of knowing and, and you know, believe that, that what you experience is real. And there is no reason that it's not real. It breaks my heart 
we're in a society now that's almost denied. Uh, you know, one third of our brain, the, the, you know, the, the, the spiritual aspect of uh, life. And as I've told you, we pay a terrible price for that. You know, we pay billions of dollars a year in unnecessary medical care because we're too afraid to talk about death and die. You know, but that's, that's the kind of thing uh, that happened to her. Sometimes these things come through the natural world. You know, sometimes the world itself arranges for it. And the one commonly thing uh, seen is uh, many people have these Christian Christmas cactuses that they bloom the same time every year, usually November, December. And they'll shift the, um, the you know, the, uh, the timing of the bloom will often shift uh, in response to some tragedy. And I remember I was... Uh, giving a talk uh, at the um, Children's Hospital uh, in Ohio. And one of the residents uh, volunteered to drive me back to the uh, airport and because she w wanted to talk to me. And she'd had this terrible experience where one night she fell asleep after she'd picked up her son uh, and had a tragic car accident and, you know, and uh, he, he passed as a result of it. And she was consumed with this guilt. And so I was just sort of, you know, just sort of generically talking. About, well, you know, a lot of times, you know, clocks will strike that hadn't worked before, or radios will start playing that aren't plugged in. Or it could even be a Christmas cactus, uh, you know, that suddenly starts to bloom on the anniversary of the death. She looked at me like I was some kind of psychic. <laughs> said, oh, my God. The reason that I volunteered to drive you back to the airport was I wanted to tell you that, that that's what happened to us. And I wanted to know, I mean, is, are we just crazy? I mean, is it, you know, do Christmas cactuses just, you know, is it just a coincidence? I guess she was asking. And I could tell her, you know, physician to physician, scientist to scientist, absolutely not. This is not a coincidence. And by the way, I, I trained at Johns Hopkins. Um, and, and one of my professors here used to say, coincidence is the province of the lazy mind. <laughs> well, it is, though. I mean, if we're just going to, you know, instead of looking head on at this and saying, wow, how could that happen? How could it work? You know, how could the natural world actually uh, to bring us a spiritual message. Um, it, and yet it does. And yet, you know, this is why, you know, she, she, we had to pull over. Um, she was driving and she just could not stop sobbing. I had to, I had to drive myself to the, to the, I had to drive to get to the airport on time. Um, and then, you know, she composed herself, you know, et cetera. But um, these experiences have the power to plant the seeds to heal grief. I'm not saying that, you know, her life was not great after that. I'm not saying, you know, that, uh, but at least she had some idea. And, you know, I'll come back again and tell you why this is a spiritual reality, but the neuroscience backs it up. This is a created reality. This is an illusionary reality. We make a mental image of what we think is real. Even colors, Tia, do not exist in nature. That's how unreal this reality is. The, the red doesn't occur in nature. We, we invent what we think is the color red, and then we spend tons of time talking to each other. Endless hours teaching our children, that's red, that's red, that's red, that's red, that's blue, that's blue. We do that because we make our mental image of this reality. Well, we can't do that for spirits. And that's why, you know, I, I really wanted to come and talk to you about this. You know, I, these are, be honest with you, Tia, these are pretty, um, these have, have affected me. You know, these are very personal stories. It's much easier for me to give my talk about near-death experiences, you know, et cetera. 
this old stuff that I know it's true because it's happened. You say that um, what we're looking at here, what we're immersed in here is created like a simulation. Is that correct? That's correct. And if anybody doubts it, uh, go to PBS, pretty respectable mainstream, and they have a six-part series called The Brain. And uh, if you've had a spiritual experience and you're doubting whether it's real or not, watch that six-part series. Is there any way for us to know what actual reality is like then? You yeah. know, theoretical physicists spend all their time in their spare time writing, uh, you know, so that I think the short answer is no, but the long answer is, well, they search for the no, we learn a whole lot about ourselves and this reality, you know, et cetera. But I think at the end of the day, we don't know. Um, but at least, you know, I'm trying to do today, I guess, it, the process of parents go through with children. That's red, that's red. I'm saying that's spiritual. That's real spiritual. That's spiritual. Hallucination is function of the brain. Spiritual is the of these areas of our brain. All right, I've got two more stories for you. Okay. Okay, the first story is I, the, the, the richness of spirituality surrounding death and dying is so much greater than, than you know, just, you know, what I've outlined. And I'm going to share with you um, how an angel got me in trouble uh, at my hospital. Uh, we we had a I, I you know resuscitated uh, you know the critically ill uh, newborns that was my job um, for many years and uh, we had uh, an ambulance uh, coming in with uh, a mother had what's called preeclampsia and that is a surgical emergency that means the placenta is starting to separate from uh, you know from the uh, uterine wall you know from the mother. And the baby is at risk of, you know, has to be delivered immediately. And so that uh, mother was quickly brought to, uh, to the delivery room. Uh, the emergency C-section was done. And the baby was uh, taken out and given to me to resuscitate. And you know, the, what I'm going to tell you happens. I could not intubate, meaning put that tube into the baby's I just couldn't, um, it, you know, and that happens. We have a rule in our hospital that you only try three times because otherwise you can get so caught up in trying to do it. You know, you end up just, you know, if you haven't done it in three times, you're not going to get it done. So I looked around the room and the anesthesiologist would have been the next person in line, but he seemed to be busy uh, with the mother. And it's just so happened that one of the EMT uh, um, uh, medics was in the delivery room. And uh, they are, they can intubate, you know, in, in the Seattle area, uh, you know, they intubate in the field. Uh, so I knew he knew how to intubate. And he looks at me, he's like, he has no worries. He has all the time in the world. And he looks at me and he goes, doc, why don't you let me in? Well, I said, okay. And sure enough, he the baby and uh, the baby uh, survived uh, and uh, actually had a, a very uh, benign course. Um, so it seems like a success story. This seems great, except the anesthesiologist was pissed. First of all, it's his responsibility to intubate if I can't. Second of all, the hospital doesn't have insurance for stray medics who are walking around the halls and volunteering to do medical procedures. So this all came up uh, and they uh, decided to have what's called an M&M &M meeting, uh, a morbidity and mortality meeting. You know, they put me on the hot seat, you know, basically saying, why did you do this? Um, the anesthesiologist is there. Sure, it had a great outcome, but nevertheless, we need to review our so the first thing is to identify and find the uh, medic. 
and find out, you know, his side of the story. You know, why did he do this? Tia, we couldn't find the medic. We went to uh, um, uh, to the ambulance company. I talked to the medics uh, who had uh, brought in, uh, and they said, what are you talking about? There was just two of us, and we waited in the ambulance as we're supposed to, and we know we can't just go running into your hospital and, uh, you know, uh, interfering with, you know, we don't have any insurance, and, uh, you know, we're not, you know, you know, none of it. Of course, we wouldn't do that. And we have no idea what you're talking about. In fact, nobody ever found that medic, ever. Uh, the uh, m m conference was canceled. <laughs> I dodged a bullet because uh, the, the, this person couldn't be uh, found. And I think that the mother said it all. A year later, on the anniversary of her uh, uh, child's uh, birth, she wrote me a card and she said, thank you, Dr. Morse. Thank you. And thank all the other angels that were in the delivery room that day. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's, so, so it's not, you know, so there's, there's so much, I believe, Tia, that this stuff happens more than we think. I mean, because I mean, what if it, what if, what if everybody in that case had just said, "Hey, no harm, no foul," you know, let's move on. You know, we don't have to. I mean, it was really that one very cranky anesthesiologist um, who motivated the whole thing. I'll bet you this kind of stuff is happening all the time, and yet, you know, we're just not realizing it. Um, so, uh, I, I'm going to tell you one last story because I, I want to touch on the issue of how can we facilitate and help these experiences. Um, they're so important. And so, so what can we, as you know, you know, I'm not a grieving parent, so believe me, I, you know, I spent much, much of my career counseling grieving parents, and I know that the one thing to never say is that I understand anything about it. I don't. But I have worked with grieving parents and helped them to have their own types of experiences. And I'm going to tell you uh, why why this happened. I also had a very busy private practice. I typically saw 40 to 50 patients a day. Um, and uh, my waiting room was always packed. And one of those days, um, these two parents, uh, you know, my nurse brought back these two parents, but there was no child. And so I said to them, you know, how can I help you today? And the mother looked at me and she said, we know the number of days it's been since our son died in a motorcycle accident. And we've seen Raymond and Brian, and we've taken all the workshops and we've done this and we've done that. We've traveled this country trying to find some release, some message, some meaning to this. And they said, here's our son. And they pulled out a picture of him and they pressed it in my hand. And, you know, we just thought, you know, you don't have weekend workshops. So we just thought, we're going to come to your office. <laughs> we're going to hear what you have to say. And, you know, I just felt totally incompetent and overwhelmed. And also I'm in the ear infection diagnosing mode. I'm not really in the, the mode that, that, you know, to handle, you know, something as, as you know, sensitive but fortunately for me my nurse comes in and says they need you over in the Dell room get over there so I'm just like they get okay and so I told the parents I said wait here I will be back but you know inwardly I'm thinking okay now I can collect myself and think what I'm going to say so I went over there and uh, to the Dell room it was a difficult resuscitation um, but successful uh, and then I was writing up my note afterwards, and one of the delivery nurses comes to me and says, so who's the medical student with you today? Because we did teach medical students, you know, I was on the faculty at the uh, University of Washington, you know, we that was one of our jobs. I said, well, you know, actually, I didn't have a medical student today, um, just in one of those days. And she said, oh, no, you did. She said, I saw him. He, he followed you around. He was just like a medical student. He stuck to you like glue. 
You know, when you went in, went in the Dell room, he went in with you. You know, when you came out, you know, uh, you know, look, he's right over there, you know, watching you write your note. And I thought, is this him? And I pulled out the picture they'd given. And he said, he, the nurse said, yes, that's him. You know, why do you have a picture of your medical student? <laughs> and, wow. So I went back to those parents and I told them what happened. I said, your son, he is with you. He, you know, you're traveling the country, going to these various workshops, and he's following along with you, obviously. And I thought to myself, what can I tell them? I said, you know, I really would like you to return. They lived in New York. I'd like you to return to New York. I had my nurse uh, find a, it's a group called Compassionate Friends that uh, they work with uh, grieving parents. We found the, um, uh, you know, the Compassionate Friends uh, uh, in their area. I said, I want you to talk to a counselor, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, counselor. And I want you to start, I want you to write Right before you go to bed, ask a sincere question of the universe. And then the first thing when you wake up, I want you to write the answer. And they did this for a while, but it really wasn't necessary because she told me that the second night that she had done this, she woke up in the middle of the night and there was her son at the foot of the bed saying, Mommy, stop crying. I'm okay. I'm okay. Um, so, you know, that taught me to look deeper into this issue of, you know, how can we help parents to have these experiences? And uh, I, uh, you know, really, I wouldn't say it's a program, but I developed, uh, you know, I guess tips are more like it. Um, I have found that that journaling that asking that sincere question it's got to be sincere from your heart that's why you gotta you gotta know neuroscience is on your side it is <laughs> write to me through my website if you like i i will convince you um neuroscience has got your back so you can ask that sincere question and not feel stupid and then write down the very first thought that you have in the morning. And just do this again and again and again. And patterns will start to come out of that. Patterns that will help you to understand what's going on. But the second thing that I've had, that I've done, that is um, I talked to a parent. Um, well, actually, it was these same parents. Um, I wanted to know what was their routine? When did they spend their son. And the mother told me that the important time for them was when he would come home from school, like particularly middle school. And uh, she would be cooking dinner and she would have cookies, etc. I mean, remember, this is 30 years ago. You know, nobody's having cookies out the day after. But, but actually, I mean, it's, you know, actually, it's very common back in the day. Um, and then that was a time where he would tell her about uh, his day and, uh, you know, and she would tell him about uh, her day. And so I asked her to recreate that, to just do everything that she would have been doing, put a seat for him, and then just wait and see what happens, you know, but just keep doing this ritual again and again and again. And sure enough, the kinds of things that came out of that ritual, extremely reassuring to her. And again, planted those seeds uh, of uh, healing. So, so, so finding some sort of ritual. That, because then once, well, why? Well, you know, I, I have been, I, I have had losses in my life and I've been consumed with grief not you know what a parent feels but you can't think straight 
Thoughts are constantly intruding into your mind. You're you're overwhelmed. You know, it, it, you know, the depression. You know, emotions are real. Emotions are facts, as my wife likes to say. And yet, when you start to do some sort of ritual, then you can break out of that because you're just thinking, what ingredients do I need for the cookies? Okay, where is the flour? Where is the butter? You know, and by doing that over and over again, then you can start to regulate and put some boundaries on your own thought processes. And you can start to reflect back to yourself. One of the most powerful things is to say, oh, I'm obsessing about, you know, my son again, you know, oh, you know, so that's a lot of what journaling does. It puts another third person between you and the actual experiencing the grief. You know, when you journal, then you can see it in black and white. Oh, look how often I'm obsessing about this. Oh, look how often I'm thinking about that. And these types of tools are extremely important because the message is coming towards you. Um, that seventy percent of grieving parents report having some sort of experience of communication. So how can they be hallucinations if seventy percent of the population is having it? Grieving widows and widowers, again, usually by these types of ritualistic techniques. You know, uh, getting out his suit, uh, you know, packing him for a trip, uh, you know, whatever, you know, might be 50% of the time. The grief literature says that these types of, you know, hallucinations occur. They're not hallucinations. They're the proper functioning of your brain. But sometimes you have to discipline your brain and you have to, you know, start to set some boundaries and understand, uh, you know, start to control, you know, when you think certain things and when you're willing to think other things, you know, to not let your brain intrude. And those are the two techniques that I know, journaling uh, and creating a, a meaningful ritual. Um, but I think it's important also to talk about this. Stop feeling that you're crazy. In, 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 in modern American society, the hallmark of the true spiritual experience, if you want to ask, you know, ask me, how do I know a great one's coming that I can really know is true? It starts with, you will think I'm crazy, but. And I learned this from a hospice nurse that um, she uh, worked with a patient uh, and then eventually the patient was sent home to die. And she went home uh, and was with the family and had this experience of watching the little boy was in the room. She looked out the window and she saw the little boy walking down the path. And he seemed to have his hand. His hand was in the air and there seemed to be a hand holding his hand. And she was like, you know, I mean, as, as, as you would or I would, I mean, what, you know, I mean, is that real? I mean, how can it be true? You know, and, uh, you know, and she knows what's going on uh, in, and the parents are asking her questions and she's trying to, you know, help with you know, this dying process. And yet that's what she saw. So at the um, memorial service for the boy, she finally gets up enough courage to talk to the mother about it. And this is harder than you think, because as physicians and nurses, we're trained to not go, to not go there with patients. We're trained to not talk about spirituality. You know, and what if God forbid they have a different belief system than you? And you know, what if you're a Protestant and they're a, you know, some other religion? Uh, you know, I mean, all of that is uh, the culture is to not discuss spirituality. Um, and yet she got up her courage because she just felt she had to tell the mother. I mean, 
She's a trained observer. She can trust her observations. So she told the mother. And the mother gasped and said, my husband saw the same thing too. So once they started to talk about it and compare notes, it had its own internal validation. And that happens a lot. You'd be surprised how often these experiences, I think because the universe wants us to know they're true and they contain their own sense of validation. And they just, they happen to us again and again and again and again. And, you know, once you start to talk about them, one of my best friends, uh, Lance, uh, his daughter, uh, born with severe disabilities, she never actually was able to talk. Lance loved her so much, he would still have birthday parties for her, take her to the zoo, you know, everything. And she eventually passed. In the last picture of her, they took a picture of her against the hospital wall, and this, you know, her face and then the white wall. On the year of the anniversary of her death, he got out that picture again. And it was no longer a white wall. But it had that tunnel with the Chris Eggleston's picture of the noodle, you know, had that tunnel with the rainbow uh, in it. And yet, you know, if he wasn't aware, he would have just thought, oh, this is, a, you know, some weird thing. Well, and we're scientists. So, of course, he actually did have the picture taken to someone familiar with photoshopping and digital uh, you know recreations and wanted to know you know could this have been faked somehow is this somebody putting you know maybe a well-meaning prank on me and of course you know it could not you know it, it was not uh, the result of any uh, manipulation um but the point is that he was willing to dare to believe that it's true and that, you know, that's that's what I've learned, is that these experiences, we, they're more common than we think. Science does have your back. It's so often that you have to trust your own instincts. And that message, if you're too upset, then maybe it's come some other way. Maybe a neighbor has uh, heard it. Maybe your best friend and they're, you know, they're not wanting to tell you for, you know, because they don't want to sound crazy themselves. We have to start a dialogue about the spirituality of death and dying. And as I said before, it's a tragedy what goes on in intensive care units today. It is, you know, uh, a guy named Z Dog MD uh, is a physician. He likes to make these funny uh, YouTube videos. He made a serious one called, this is not the way to die. And yet we're doing it and we're doing it and nobody thinks it's right. The doctors think the patients want it. The patients think the doctors want it. They're, they're walled off from these types of spiritual experiences and it's costing us a lot of money. So it's not just, it's not just for, you know, for, you know, in the scientific world, you know, we're always, oh, that's just woo-woo stuff. Oh, you're still studying that woo-woo stuff, Dr. Morris. You know, you know, singing the Twilight Zone theme song, you know, the hospital albums. And I just look them right back and I said, no, this is the billions of dollars a year and it can revolutionize the way we care for dying patients. You have lived a fascinating life and what a gift, oh my gosh, to be able to have spoken with all of these people, not only people that have had near death experiences, but people who experienced the other side of the coin where they've lost someone, just incredible. And for you to compile all that and share it with, with us today, I can't even tell you how much I appreciate it. Um, well, I really appreciate your having me on the show to share this. And I, well, I want to talk to you again about the the spiritual universe, that this is a spiritual plane. I think Absolutely. that's very interesting. 
Um, that's a whole other topic we could probably spend hours on. So we'll have to make arrangements to have you on again for that because I think that's a topic that really resonates with me. And I think a lot of people, it, it's new and a new idea for them. They've never been introduced to it. Um, and so if we can get that information out there, maybe people can learn more about it and I'll give a teaser then for it because I send me a link and I'll sign up again. Okay. Um, there's no other side. I always hear people talking about the other side. They, I got a message from the other side. There's no other side. This is the other side. We're in the other side. We're the spiritual reality. All right. I well, can't thank you wait. so much, Tia. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll send you a link and we'll get that set up. I can't wait for it. Um, Gosh, thank you. Thank you so much. It's thank just, you. What a pleasure to talk with you. Oh, it, the pleasure is all mine, as always. I enjoy every minute. Um, and we'll talk soon. Thank you for being here. I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you being here and supporting my channel. If you haven't already subscribed, please consider subscribing if you enjoy near-death experiences and other spiritually transformative stories. It helps the algorithm know that this information is useful and push it out to more people. And that's the goal, to get as many people to know that we are eternal spiritual beings and that we never die. Our bodies might die, but our essence will never die. And I want people to live with less fear. Let's all spread the word, like, comment, subscribe, share, hit that little notification bell so you get all the notifications when my videos post. Thank you for all of your support. I'm sending love to you.